Paul Bunty is here and he's just getting his bearings. There he is. And all those daffodils. <laughs> oh, that's good. I hope everybody is doing well and having fun, smiling and laughing during the week. Okay. I've been thinking about what uh, sutta to give today. But I haven't really decided yet. I think 44. <clears throat> this is the shorter discourse on questions and answers. So Thus, if I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary, I could never figure out why they would pick a place that had a squirrel sanctuary. Because they uh, have a tendency to climb on you and do all kinds of things while you're sitting. And that can turn into a troublesome sit. Anyway, then the lay followers Visaka went to the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina. Visaka was the husband of Dhammadina. Bhikkhuni Damadina was an arahat. <clears throat> After paying homage to her, he sat down at one side and asked, Lady, personality, personality is said, what is called personality by the Blessed One? Friend Bisaka, these five aggregates affected by clinging, by craving and clinging, are called personality by the Blessed One. That is, the material form aggregate affected by craving and clinging, the feeling aggregate affected by craving and clinging. The perception aggregate affected by craving and clinging. The formations aggregate affected by craving and clinging. And the consciousness aggregate affected by craving and clinging. These five aggregates, which may be affected by craving and clinging, depending on the sharpness of your mindfulness at that time. If it, uh, the aggregate is affected by craving and clinging, that means you have uh, hindrances coming up when it's affected by craving and clinging. So, when it's unaffected by craving and clinging, that means that you're staying on your object of meditation without any distractions at all. When it's affected by craving and clinging, that is what is called personality. Saying good, the lady, the lay follower Visaka delighted and rejoiced in the Bhikkhuni Dhammadina's words. Then he asked her a further question. Now, the first question 
is actually talking about the first noble truth. Okay, in the second question, origin of personality, origin of personality is said, what is called the origin of personality by the Blessed One? Friend Visaka, it is craving. And that's why we have the six R's, because that relieves craving. So that you can uh, actually purify your mind every time you use the six R's. Craving is accompanied by delight and lust and delights in this and that. That's a partial description of craving because there's aversion that's in that mix too. Aversion, dislike, things like that. Trying to push away things that you don't want to be there. <clears throat> that is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for being and craving for non-being. This is called the origin of personality by the Blessed One. Lady, cessation of personality, cessation of personality is said. What is called the cessation of personality by the Blessed One? Now, this is the third noble truth. Friend Visaka, it is the remainderless fading away and cessation, the giving up, relinquishing, letting go, relaxing, and rejecting of that same craving. Again, this is why the six R's are so important. You recognize, you release. Uh, release is an important thing for you to understand. When a hindrance comes up, you release it by not keeping your attention on it. As soon as you notice that you're getting involved in something, you are feeding that hindrance. And the more you feed it, the bigger it gets. Even the slightest bit of curiosity about what was that? What is that that's, that's happening right now? If you keep your attention on it, then you are feeding it and you're causing yourself a lot more suffering. So it's important for you to recognize that as soon as you see that hindrance, you have to let it be by itself and relax. The relaxed step lets go of the craving. If you stay with that distraction, then the craving is still there. You haven't let go of it, anything really. So it's important for you to understand clearly that you need to let it be by itself and relax. As you relax, you will notice that your mind is clear, your mind is very observant, and your mind is pure at that time. Then you bring up your smile. The smile is super important. 
doesn't get mentioned much in the way of the suttas. But I found through my own practice of many years that with a smile, become, mind becomes lighter. If you do different kinds of meditation and you don't have that smile, your mind has a tendency to get more and more serious. And that causes more and more suffering. Then you come back to your object of meditation, which can be any number of things, any one of the jhanas or arupa jhanas. And you're able to stay with that for longer and longer periods of time. There's one sutta that Sariputta would go out and he would sit in meditation all day. And when he came back, Ananda would look at him and he would say, your features are very bright, you're radiating a very light uh, mind that shows through the face. Now, I just got through giving a retreat and because I could see you, that I, I could see that your face is getting lighter and lighter, which tells me that you're doing it right. You're doing the meditation correctly. So it's important to understand that you stay with your object of meditation for as long as you possibly can without any disturbance. The more you smile, the sharper your mindfulness becomes. The easier it is to recognize when your mind starts to get heavy. So, It's important for you to have a light mind while you're meditating. If you start getting serious, the radiance in your mind starts disappearing. And your mind has a tendency to get more and more uh, heavy and serious and this causes all kinds of problems so the more you can smile have fun with your meditation not be serious with it play it like it's a game laugh with yourself when you get caught and the way to overcome a lot of fear and anxiety is by having a light mind and relaxing into it and smiling with it and laughing with it. Lady, the way leading to the cessation of personality. Now this is the fourth noble truth the way leading to the cessation of personality is said. What is the way leading to the cessation of personality by, by the, said by the Blessed One? What is the way? The way is practicing right effort, which is the six R's. That is the path. And we'll get into more of that in just a minute. <clears throat> Friend Visaka, it is just this noble eightfold path. That is, now this 
talks about write this and write that. And I don't like that so much because it kind of paints the world into black and white. And there's a lot of grays. So I would prefer to use the word harmonious. That's a positive, gentle way of looking at the Eightfold Path. Now, in the, in the book, it says right view. I call it harmonious perspective. What does that mean? Harmonious perspective means having the view that is impersonal. Seeing things as part of a process rather than taking your thoughts and feelings personally. When you change your view, when you start seeing things in an impersonal way, you start developing more and more um, enchant disenchantment with things you start developing more and more equanimity to things. That means that you let go of your emotional upsets much more quickly, more easily. So right view, harmonious perspective is the very start of the Eightfold Path. And it is important this is one of the most important aspects of the Buddha's teaching. And that is how you get to become more and more free, more and more open with your thinking. And this is how you start developing a sense of humor about what's occurring. Now this sounds odd because almost all of the other types of meditation, people have a tendency to get, uh, they can have joy and bliss while they're in the sitting, but with their daily activities, there's no real change in their personality. With this, twim this kind of meditation it develops this meditation so that you have more and more equanimity more balance in your life the things that used to get you upset now they don't upset you so much so it's a real interesting phenomenon that starts to happen and you wind up being happy a lot of the time. I have people that are writing to me that did a, did a retreat two, three, four years ago. And they write, they haven't done a retreat since, but they thank me for teaching them how this impersonal nature is so important and they are happy a lot of the time. Life still has its ups and downs. You can't get away from that. That's what it's like. That's what it is to be a human being going through these things. But it depends on your change of perspective. And the change of perspective always comes from seeing the impersonal nature of everything it becomes very clear that this is super important. The next part of the Eightfold Path. Now in the first editions of Bhikkhu Bodhi, he called it right thought. And in the last, I think, two editions, he's changed right thought to right intention, which I don't really care for very much. I call this 
fold of the eightfold path, I call it harmonious imaging. Now we all hold images of what we want to see happen. And as we get more clear with our imaging, these things start to happen more and more automatically. Now, what, is an, what kind of image do you hold about yourself? Do you think of yourself as being happy, uplifted, fun person? Is that the kind of image you hold to yourself? Well, most people don't hold that image of themselves, so they're not that way very often. It's a real good thing to consciously work at having an image that you would like to see happen. An image that I have for myself is that I'm very prosperous. And I have maybe 10,000 students. And that's what I would call prosperous. It doesn't necessarily have to do with your financial uh, your, your financial situation. Thank you. So being prosperous, when I first started, we came back from Asia and I started going around the United States and um, I, I took bus rides from the east, West Coast to the East Coast. And people thought that I was absolutely crazy. Why don't you fly? Well, I wanted to see what the United States was. I was in Asia for 12 years. What's happening with people in the United States? I didn't know. I wanted to see. And taking the bus in this country is high luxury compared to buses in Asia. So I was perfectly comfortable. I mean, I had a, a seat that I could lean back and go to sleep, so there was no problem. And I got to experience people from all different parts of the United States. Now, even then, I was considering myself and considering the kind of image that I wanted to be. And I wanted to be prosperous in this country. Now, as I was traveling across country, there would be strangers that would walk up to me and say, I'd like to have my picture taken with you. That never happened in Asia although I had my picture taken many tens of thousands of times. But it wasn't with a stranger. It was always with somebody that I knew. They wanted to have a picture with me, fine. And then I would start talking to them and they say, why are you dressed like this? And I said, I'm a Buddhist monk. And they had no idea what I was talking about. So I, was, I would talk with them about the ups and downs of life and how to have more and more balance in that. And some of them really got it, some of them didn't, but that's the way it is. Some people are super interested and some people only, only partially interested. So I got to see and overcome my culture shock. But even after being here for 20, more than 20 years in this country, I still have culture shock. 
because for the last 10 years or so, I've been going to Asia during the winter time. And I still had had my, my Asian understanding of things. But every time I came back to America, it takes me a little while to adjust. And that's being prosperous too. That's learning. That's teaching yourself. And liking yourself. Being prosperous means not beating myself up because I made a mistake. Not criticizing myself by developing a sense of humor by myself. That's all part of being prosperous. I know people in this country that they have an image of always being poor. And as a result, they're always poor. So it's, it's pretty amazing to see the importance of holding a positive image about yourself and reminding yourself that you are that way. You hold an image of being kind and you will be kind. You hold an image of uh, being generous and you will be generous. So it's important for you to pick a, a mental state, an image that you want to live up to. You hold an image of being intelligent and you will be intelligent. Your intuition will start to kick in more. And we'll talk more about intuition in a bit. The next fold of the Eightfold Path. Bhikkhu Bodhi calls it right speech. I call it harmonious communication. And harmonious communication means not only when you communicate to other people in a kind way, but being kind to yourself. I spend a lot of time with people that come, reminding them to be kind to themselves, to be accepting of themselves. Yes, we all make mistakes. And it's okay to make a mistake as long as you don't do it over and over again. So you don't want to be beating yourself up because you don't like an outcome or the way something happened. It's important for you to let that be and forgive yourself for making the mistake. Just don't do it again. That's how you train yourself to let go of old habits and develop new habits that are peaceful, calm, and lead to happiness, not only in you, but to everyone around you. Harmonious communication is very, very important. So the more you hold that image of being kind, not only to yourself, but to everyone around you, of uh, holding an image of um, keeping a precepts without breaking them and liking yourself because of that. When you do that, when you keep the precepts for a period of time, then it's real interesting that your intuition becomes more 
easily recognizable. Your intuition will tell you um, sometimes don't walk across the street right now. So you look more carefully and see, yeah, that's a good thing. Your intuition can be getting in touch with someone else and talking with them. Follow your intuition. Your intuition, or let's say the, the keeping of the precepts helps to quiet the thoughts in your mind. And your intuition is a quiet little voice that's always right. If you follow your intuition, you'll have all kinds of wonderful things happening to you. And this is harmonious communication. Now the next fold of the Eightfold Path, Bhikkhu Bodhi calls it right action. I call it harmonious movement. Don't be jerking your mind around and trying to control your thoughts. Be more mindful, be more alert as to what is actually happening. Now, the, the next part of the Eightfold Path is the Kubodi calls it right livelihood, and they give a definition in the books. Don't kill living beings. Uh, don't, don't sell poisons to kill other beings. Uh, and live in a happy, uplifted way. Don't steal anything, don't take what's not given. And all of these different parts of livelihood. But I call this harmonious lifestyle. If you hold the image of being generous and kind and helpful to other people, if you hold that image, you're living a right livelihood. Now, I've told this story I, well, probably a thousand times that a lady came to me in, in Malaysia complaining about having nightmares. And I asked her, why? Why are you having nightmares? And she said, I don't know, but they seem to happen right after I go to the movies. So I asked her, what kind of movies do you go see? Oh, I go to horror movies. And I said, well, don't do that. What are you putting in front of your mind? That's part of right livelihood. Putting things in front of your mind that naturally lead towards the wholesome. Scaring to yourself to death because it's in a movie is not a pleasant feeling to me. It's a painful feeling and it causes all kinds of problems. So don't do that. But she said, but I love it. I love to be scared like that. It gives me a high rush. And I said, fine, well, don't come to me about your nightmares. One of the advantages of doing the meditation is you don't have quite as many dreams. I have almost no dreams that I can remember. I'm sure I have some, but I don't wake up afraid because of a dream ever. And I attribute that to the practice that I do. So right livelihood is being careful about the things you put in front of yourself. Be careful 
uh, reading the newspaper. What nonsense is that? Or watching the news on television. It doesn't lead to your happiness or the happiness of people around you. It leads to wrong kinds of communication. And where people argue a lot. Oh, I like this person. I don't like that person. I had a lady that read five newspapers a day. And she was always depressed. And the only colors that she was wearing was like being in, in London. You have grays, you have blacks, you have white, you have some browns, but no real colors like the color behind me. Look at the yellow. Isn't that wonderful? So I told her, first, you have to stop reading the newspapers and stop watching the news. Anything that's important, you will hear about it from somebody else. You don't need to read about it and make your mind unhappy because things aren't going the way you want them to go. So, be careful with your lifestyle. And lifestyle also includes the five precepts. The closer you keep your precepts, the more magical life turn, turns out to be. You can have, have something pop into your mind. Oh, it'd be nice to see this. And all of a sudden it appears. And that is because of the purity of keeping the precepts. Now there's nobody that's gonna stand over you with a lightning rod and zap you if you break a precept but you're gonna do that to yourself. You're gonna zap yourself with guilty feeling. So it's a real interesting thing that the closer you come to having perfect precepts, the purer your mind becomes and the faster you progress in meditation. Now, what's the cause of hindrances arising? Breaking a precept in the past. And when you first start doing the meditation, don't you have a lot of hindrances coming up? Because your past action has caused this guilty feeling to arise. And now you use the six R's and purify yourself. And then the hindrances don't come up so often. And they're easier to recognize and see. So it's a real important thing to develop a healthy lifestyle for yourself. And that leads to a lot of smiles. That leads to a lot of happiness. That leads to a light mind. Now, the next <clears throat> fold of the Eightfold Path, Bhikkhu Bodhi calls it right effort. Sometimes he calls it right striving. I call it harmonious practice. When your mind is in balance, you're able to use the six R's whenever there's disturbance. And you will be able to develop a mind that has quiet spots for a period of time. <coughs> Excuse me. Harmonious effort, harmonious practice 
is the Eightfold Path. And you practice the Eightfold Path every time you use that the six R's because you're purifying your mind and you're letting go of old hard feelings, old embarrassments because you made a mistake, old attachments. And that's what attachments are. They are sometime in the past, you broke a precept and you feel guilty about it. You feel remorse because of it. If everybody in whatever country you're in practice the six R's, there would be no need for mental uh, hospitals. If everybody practiced purifying their mind, it would be a prosperous society. There wouldn't be uh, corruption. There wouldn't be problems. I saw a movie one time that everybody in this one village was completely honest with whatever, whatever they did or whatever they said. And this one guy decided he was going to challenge that. So he went into a bank and he, he told them that he wanted money and he lied about it, but they gave him the money anyway, because they didn't recognize that he was lying because everybody tells the truth. It's kind of a cute little movie and how he saw the error of his ways. Don't remember the name of it right off, uh, but it, it is definitely a worthwhile movie to watch. So every time you use the six R's, you are experiencing a mundane form of Nibbana. You're taking the heat out of your mind and making everything cool. Now, it's kind of interesting because even back in the 50s, the late 50s, when the, the beatniks were popular, they would say things were cool. And I never really considered what a wonderful word that is. When something is cool, it's not going to burn you. When something is cool, it's on the wholesome side. So being cool, even though it's an expression that's still used today, very few people really think about it. Oh, that's cool. Well, that a lot of times they mean that, that it's some form of um, activity that's nice. That's cool to do that. Do you want to go to the ballpark? Yeah, that's cool. I have time for that. Um, there is a talk Given, given by um, Ajahn Buddhadasa. He was a Thai monk, very famous Thai monk in Thailand. Oh, I did have a, an opportunity to spend time with him. His English wasn't great. He had very little understanding of English. But I had a great time with him and I one day I asked him if he would teach me the Brahma Viharas, a loving kindness, compassion, joy and equanimity. And he said he doesn't know that. Although he practices it, 
he didn't feel like he was qualified to teach it. He was very much into mindfulness of breathing. And the only problem that I saw with the kind of practice he was talking about was the lack of recognizing craving and letting it go. <coughs> but it was really a great experience hanging out with him. He sing single-handedly changed the Thai culture away from monks just doing magic stuff to actually getting back to the Buddhist teaching. And he was quite revolutionary at that time. So it was good to hang out with him. I, I really enjoyed it. He would give a Dhamma talk and he had a rooster that was his pet. And the rooster would always, when he sat down at this one spot, the rooster saw him and he would jump up in the, in, on his leg. And during the Dhamma talk, uh, Buddha Dasa would, would feed him pieces of corn. It was really quite, quite wonderful. So, the next fold of the Eightfold Path is, Bhikkhu Bodhi calls it right mindfulness, which is a word that's very little understood. And I call it harmonious observation. And the definition I give to mindfulness, a lot of people don't understand it because it's about directly about the practice. And a lot of people have made up their, their own definitions of what mindfulness is. And they call it just simply awareness, but it's more than that. Mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. <coughs> no, your mind just doesn't all of a sudden jump from one thing to another. It is part of a process. When you use your mindfulness correctly, when you observe how this process works. One, you stop taking things so personally. That gets back to the first step of the Eightfold Path. You stop taking it so personally. And you have a tendency to develop more balance in your mind when you see things as a process instead of taking them personally. When you take somebody something personally, it means that you're caught in craving. You have craving arise. You have that I don't like it mind or I like it mind, whatever it happens to be. But your mindfulness is not sharp enough to recognize that as soon as it starts occurring. So the closer you can observe how mind's attention is moving from one thing to another, you'll be able to catch it more quickly. When you first start doing your meditation, your mind is wobbling and, and uh, running all over the place. Your mind is like there's no control to it. But as you get deeper and deeper, <coughs> excuse me, I got something caught in my throat. Ah, 
that's better. But as you're able to notice more and more, you'll notice that your mind is not flip-flopping like this. As you go deeper, it gets so that your mind is vibrating. When you get into the fourth jhana, your mind vibrates. And then as you go deeper, the vibration becomes more and more subtle until you get to neither perception nor non-perception where you can't tell. Sometimes there's a perception of something that arises, but it's so subtle you don't see it. So when you get into that state, before coming out of that state, it's good for you to reflect on what happened during that sitting. And you'll notice that there are some things that will arise that you didn't really notice. It wasn't very clear because mind is so subtle. And uh, when you notice whatever it is that arises, then use the six R's and let it be by itself and relax and just let go and go on to whatever else comes up. It only takes a couple of minutes after you uh, after you're done with the meditation right before you get up just reflect on what happened while you were in that state so the next fold of the eightfold path is what bhikkhu bodhi calls right concentration which really causes a lot of confusion and i call it harmonious collectedness. What's the difference between a concentrated mind and a collected mind? A collected mind is very alert. Your mind is very composed and your mind can be quite still on your object of meditation. A concentrated mind is a mind that when you get to a certain depth in your practice, the force of the concentration suppresses hindrances from coming up. So the concentration goes actually deeper and with no hindrances arising, of course, you have a type of pure mind. But that goes away as you lose your concentration. See, the, the six R's, it, it teaches you how to recognize different things and how to take care of these different things, even during your daily activities. So your mind can be very composed, very at ease. Your mind can be quiet, even during your daily activities. I've given a, a few talks about the importance of making a determination to go into a jhana and try to stay in that jhana for the entire day. So you can experience joy, you can experience happiness, you can experience equanimity while you're living your life. This is the importance of the book that I wrote called Life is Meditation, Meditation is Life.
Too many people have the idea that you only meditate when you are sitting. But that's only a small part of the practice. You need to be able to meditate all day. And if you are able to stay in a jhana all day, your mind has been pure for that period of time. And with a pure mind comes all kinds of mystical, magical kinds of things occurring for you. Sometimes I can think about something or about someone and they call on the phone or they they get in touch with me one way or another and that's just because i had a thought about them and wish them well of course <clears throat> so i got through the eightfold path with the sutta but I'm seeing that we're running out of time. <laughs> so why don't we um, see if we have any questions? Hello, you, guys, you guys that were doing a retreat with me, do you have any questions? Huh? Bonte, hello, can you hear me? Barely. Okay, hold the on. Volume, volume is very low. Let me bring the microphone a little closer. Is this better? Uh, that's a bit better, yeah. Okay. Um, I have two questions for you today, Bonte. Okay. Uh, one question is, um, you talked about harmonious imaging. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how to sort of uh, make that a practice or like, you know, decide what your image is and sort of, is that something you verbalize? Well, or how do you... you take a good quality that you like and think about it often. Notice how you see that quality in other people and appreciate them. Okay. Okay. Sounds, uh, that's something to work with. Um, what, what's the other question you had? So my other question is, um, you know, often it's about the, the Maha Paranibbana Sutta. Um, uh, about, you know, the Buddha's uh, Parinibbana. Um, I've often wondered when I read that sutta, you know, there's a part in the sutta where um, the Buddha is telling Ananda that... Get, get closer to your mic. I'm having real trouble hearing you. Yeah. Uh, better? Was better or worse? You know, let me let me uh, let me adjust my microphone situation, and I'll I'll pop okay. in again for a question. Well, try just try to speak a little bit louder. See if that okay. helps. Uh, how is this? There, there, that's uh, great. All right. Um. So my question is uh, in the Diga Nikaya about the the Parinibbana Sutta. Right. Um, I've often wondered, you know, when the Buddha is talking to Ananda and sort of suggesting that he could stay alive for, you know, maybe hundreds or thousands of more years. Um, and no. <clears throat> that, that's a misinterpretation. He would have been able to stay for another 40 years. Oh, 40. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is, why does he leave that up to whether or not Ananda, you know, understands what he's saying. Um, I've always thought that was kind of odd. Well, he was a close confidant. 
What can I say? I mean, he, he wanted an opinion. Oh, okay. So he, he was asking for an opinion. Right. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Never okay. really thought, thought that way. Okay, thank you. Okay. Viviana, how are you doing? Me? Yeah. I'm I'm actually better. Okay. You Thank still you feel me. like you need to continue on with yeah. your forgiveness? Yes. Your face looks a lot lighter today than it was yesterday, so that makes me happy. It helps, yeah, it helped. Yeah. Okay. Thank Do you have any question or anything? Um basically for how long should i continue with the forgiveness i mean it's the same until relief comes but it's an ongoing process i guess well i did it for two years <laughs> it's up to you <clears throat> you'll get to a place where your mind says well i don't need to do this anymore and when that happens just go back to the uh, loving kindness meditation okay okay Patience leads to Nibbana. I will remember that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. I have a question, Bhante. Okay. Um, during the retreat, you made some very helpful uh, comments around uh, the use of intuition. Right. And I... I thought that, that might be good to hear a little more, but also to share that into the wider group as well. Well, I was going to do that next week, but um, trusting your intuition. When you run across a hindrance and it's really troublesome and it, it seems to last for a long time, ask yourself, why is this happening? What's the cause of this? Uh, I, I'll give you an example that happened to me. Um, I was working at a meditation center. The teacher asked me to sit with this other man so he wouldn't be alone and do, do the retreat. And I was restless. Now, at the meditation center, I was kind of the handyman making the doing things and fixing things and like that. And I'm not prone to restlessness. I'm more prone to sloth and torpor. That's just my personality type. And here I am feeling restless. So I ask myself, this is weird. Why is this happening? <clears throat> and then I went back to doing the meditation the way I was taught. And a short time later, my intuition said, you're spending too much time thinking about the things that need to be done. Okay, I was spent, I was not on my object of meditation as much as I needed to be. And that's why I was restless. As soon as I saw that, then I went, oh, yeah, that's really true. So I stayed on my object of meditation, which was the breathing at the time. <clears throat> And my mind settled down and I didn't have so much in, uh, problem with restlessness. One of the things that happens for people is they have an idea of the way they want things to occur. They had a good sitting, so they want another good sitting. That simple longing, that simple desire to have that arise causes your mind to have restlessness in it. So 
it's real important for you to ask yourself, what is the cause and condition for this arising? Why is it arising? Why is this restlessness here? And your mind will come back and say, well, you're, you, you're trying too hard. You have to back off. You have to soften your mind. Whatever the question is, it will give you an answer that will help solve that question. Your intuition is always right. It's just that you have to pay attention to it. Okay? And I'll talk more about that next week. Any other question? Yes, thank you, Bante, for your talk. Um, You're welcome. I have a, a question. If someone is able to stay in jhana throughout the day with their daily activities, do they still need to sit to practice? Well, see, the thing with the meditation, you need to sit and have that quiet time, that time for yourself so you can actually go deeper. So I want to say, yes, you need to sit because you, you don't need to sit for maybe as long, but it's still a nice thing to do to be able to be in that jhana. And you'll find that you become much more efficient with your job when you don't have these distractions coming in and pulling you away. You're staying with that joyful, happy feeling. And the answers from your intuition become very clear. So you're working on something and there's, it's kind of a problem at home. Well, you're not gonna have your mind distracted going home because it was a problem. Now you're going to be staying with what you're doing in your job with a happy mind. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? May I have a question, please? Yes. Please. Thank you, Bonte. I uh, I have a questions about to remember observing uh, my movement from one object to the other. Mm -hmm. How we do it at the same time when we stay in the object of meditations? No, you just pay attention to one thing at a time. If you're staying with your object of meditation, you're not going to have the distraction when your mindfulness is good. Only when your mind gets distracted, that's when you need the mindfulness to be able to observe what happened first, what happened after that. When you start seeing the pattern of how these things arise, you'll recognize them more and more quickly. And that is particularly useful with when when you're sitting with the higher kinds of jhanas, the arupa jhanas. But when our mindfulness is not sharp enough, then we normally forgot about that. Well, and you realize only when you get distracted pretty long. Well, that means your mindfulness isn't sharp and you got caught. So don't criticize yourself for that. Just start again. See that it's real important for you to um, play life like it's a game and you have fun with it. 
instead of uh, getting into your disappointment and frustration because you you made a mistake and that's all it is so forgive yourself for making the mistake and continue on but do it with the light mind with a fun mind okay yes Bante. thank you Bante. okay How's it going, Al? <laughs> All right. Any other question? Hi, Bante. Yes. Um, thank you for your talk. Always. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so we have in, in our meditation group, we, after your recommendation, um, like some six or eight weeks back to start reading from the suttas. We have started doing that um, with the uh, Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta and a couple of the, the Metta Suttas. Good. Um, is there any, like for kind of for this beginning stage, is there any other like yeah, short? There's, there's a lot of beginners. Uh, in the Majjhima Nikaya, 135, about karma. 135. And, and how it works, yeah. Um, uh, the Another one that it can be a beginner meditation or not is 111. Sounds like a good number. Yeah, one by one as they occur. Okay. That's for the, is that for the jhanas or? Yeah, it goes through all the jhanas, but that can be for beginners as well as people that are practicing and they're, they're moving along or it can be for advanced people. Okay. I made up a list one time and I put all I put beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And I had that sutta in each one and I got criticized for it. <laughs> but they didn't understand. But it, it, it's okay, no problem. But there's there's some real fun suttas. Um, Sutta number 64, I can't remember the name of it. Sutta number 62, the advice to Rahula. Mm -hmm. I use that one a lot. And so I, would, I would do it with here, but it takes a lot. It, it takes about an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes to go through it. Mm. So we, we would probably split it up in several sessions. Well, I tried to do that, but it seemed like I don't go back to it after I've already done <laughs> part of it. But everybody that did the retreat all had great benefit from the meditation. And I'm quite happy with finding out that I can give a retreat on this and have people be successful that that really makes me happy so we'll be doing more of those in the future we might even be doing one one retreat that's just forgiveness and every every uh, we'll give uh, a lot more dhamma talks on the forgiveness itself. Thank you, Monte. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Bante? Yes. Uh, hi, Bante. Uh, thank you for the talk. 
Yes. Uh, I have two questions, both are about jhanas. Uh, so the first one is quite a simple question. Uh, so the question is, uh, the words that are used to describe the jhanas and the suttas, and in particular, I'm right now I'm looking at uh, the Arya Parisana Sutta. Um, the, the words are generally rapture and pleasure. Uh, so those are I the I don't two. like those words. I okay, don't so, use them. I call, I call it... <clears throat> I call it joy and happiness. Right. They describe more clearly what is being uh, experienced in the sutta. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I rapture, think you answered. Rapture. The bhikkhu bodhi gets rapture mixed up with um, other words that get real confusion. So I try to stay away that it's kind of a Christian word. Mm -hmm. So I, I stay away from that as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the only reason I ask this is because um, I have felt this physical, uh, I felt physical sensations of pleasure through, through meditation, which are quite strong. Right. So I, so I, I don't know if that's what is be, is referred to by the word rapture, but it sounds quite a strange word to use in, in this context. Well, yeah, it is. I, I definitely prefer joy. Right. Uh, the, the, the funny thing is, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that I've felt uh, any great degree of mental joy. Uh, I, I feel... Uh, well, if you feel pleasure. light in your body and light in your mind and there's a happy kind of excited feeling, that mm -hmm. is joy. I see. Uh, I guess I was just expecting something more intense, uh, some euphoric happiness or something well, like that. That can happen. There's different degrees. I see. That makes sense. And and they they occur when conditions are right for them to occur. They occur on their own. Mm -hmm. You can't sit around and wait for this rapture or this ecstatic feeling mm -hmm. to occur because that's the very thing that stops it from occurring. Yeah. Yeah. But you'll have you'll have different kinds of joy. I mean the the awakening factor of joy is different than the, the lower jhana feeling of joy. Mm -hmm. so, so, um, yeah. And quite often in the talks, I, I will describe five different kinds of joy. Right. 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 Uh, uh, thanks for that, Bhante. Uh, so one other uh, question, and this is, um, I guess, kind of theoretical. Um, so I, I have started to think of jhanas as uh, periods in which uh, craving is either subdued. Uh, well, to there is no craving. There's when no you're craving. in a jhana, you're, there is no disturbance. Right. So um, in the in the agannas. Sutta, uh, it talks about, uh, you know, beings who are mind made uh, and who experience joy spontaneously. Um, uh, so, um, so when I when I think of, uh, and then they, uh, they then get exposed to craving, and then they start to build more and more gross bodies uh, until, until they're finally born as uh, tangible beings uh, in physical realms. So so when I uh, think of, okay, um, I, I'll, I'll let you respond to that before, before saying anything else. Well, the heavenly realms are very much different from the uh, human realm. Right. The human realm is more coarse body. Right. The heavenly realms they have to find some kind some source of energy they have to eat every day 
And what happens in the Deva Loka, in all of the Deva Lokas, is that they're, all of a sudden there manifest some grapes. So they just start munching on the grapes. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes the, a being will say, I don't want to be in this realm anymore, I want to go on. So they stop eating. And when they stop eating, they die from the Deva Loka and then reborn wherever they're going to be reborn. Mm -hmm. That's what the Buddha did. So he didn't spend a whole long time in, in the Deva realms. Mm -hmm. In the Brahma realms, it's not a physical kind of food, it is joy. Okay. Experiencing joy, that gives them the energy to continue on. And when you go to the Brahma realms, you go, you go for quite long periods of time. Mm -hmm. And it is a happy I have some students that, that go and visit these realms and they talk with the people that are uh, in, in the Brahma Lokas to see what, what they can do, what, where they can go and visit and all of this kind of thing. It's quite a, an interesting experience. I, I can imagine. Yeah. Uh, so is that the same joy that is felt in Ajana? Uh, would you say that it's the same experience? Well, it depends on what's happening in your practice. What kind of joy arises? Okay. Okay. But, okay. So, uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Please go ahead. That's, that's okay. That's okay. It's It's the... The first two jhanas that have joy in it, that's uplifting joy. Where you feel light in your mind and light in your body and you have a lot of excitement because you feel like you're starting to progress. Right. Now, if you go into the arupa jhanas, and you experience mudita, which is the uh, all-pervading kind of joy. Um, this is the awakening factor of joy. It doesn't have excitement in it, but it has a good, happy feeling, and you feel very uplifted. But the Arupa Jhana, it's Arupa because there is no Rupa, there is no body. This is strictly a mental realm. Right. And um, when I'm teaching a retreat, somebody will tell me that they have, oh, I have a pain in my back when I'm in, in this higher realm. And I say, well, that's real interesting because you don't have a body. It is mental. Right. The first verse of the Dhammapada, mind is a forerunner of all states. Okay. So if you have a pain in your body, that means your mindfulness is not very good. Mm -hmm. And you're paying attention to that pain and wanting to control it. Yeah. So, and when you look up the definition in, 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 uh, of Nama Rupa, you know, Nama basically be, means name, but it's mentality and materiality. The mentality is, it has to do with feeling, perception, 
and things like that. And the materiality is the other things that are happening in the body. They manifest through the different uh, elements. Air, um, earth, water, fire. But it, mind is the is the creator of that. All of that. Mind is the forerunner of everything. Does that make things more clear or clouded up? Um, I think it helps. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, so the, I've read some, uh, I, I read a book by uh, Lee Brasington, I believe, uh, yeah. where he, he talks about a method for entering the first jhana, which involves um, getting into what he calls access concentration. Right. And, and then focusing on some kind of pleasant feeling, which, is the, which then amplifies right. itself. Uh, can you comment on that? I can comment on it saying that there is no relaxed step, so there's still craving in a person's mind, not while they're in the jhana, but when they come out of the jhana, they haven't purified their mind at all. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a friend of mine, okay? We've had discussions about this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. In his book, he wrote about some of the dangers of doing one-pointed concentration. And he said something to the effect of, well, there's maybe three people in a thousand that don't benefit and they actually hurt themselves by doing concentration in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. that doesn't happen when you're doing what I'm showing you it doesn't happen actually in, in India one of my uh, teachers over there they ran across a man that had uh, not Alzheimer, um, had the, uh, yeah, the kind of that, uh, what's the name of that? that? I can't, well, he had, he had a mental disease, let's put it that way. And he was told that he was going to be like that for the rest of his life. Autism. And that, that's one of the things. And the other is the other kind of uh, mental disease that I can't think of the name of it right now. It doesn't matter. Anyway, he could not sit in meditation for 10 minutes without moving. And the, my, my teacher worked with him for a little while and he got so that he could sit for 10 minutes. And now he is up to being able to sit for 25 minutes without moving. And he got so excited because his mind became more peaceful and calm that he went to the, uh, the, the classes that they have and he started teaching them how to do meditation. So there are a lot of things that can be healed through meditation, but there, there's no 100% guarantee. I mentioned one time that there was a lady that 
She was in, uh, just about dead from cancer. And I went to see her. She couldn't even get out of bed. She was really, really suffering a lot. And she asked what she could do so that her mind would be more peaceful. And I gave her forgiveness meditation. And she really took it to heart. And I told her that she had to spend time with her family, forgiving them for not understanding or causing pain or whatever it was. Well, I just met her two years ago. She, her life extended seven years because of the meditation and doing it in the, in the right way. And she was really, really happy to see me. And she visited me in the hospital because I, I had a, a hernia that had to get taken care of. And she was ecstatic with how well the meditation worked. So it's not going to be for everybody. You might overcome this or that kind of mental problem or physical problem, but it's up to you. You are your own teacher and you're the one that's in charge. So you, if you run across something, you wanna try it, well, that's up to you. It's your life. The things that Lee Brazington teaches I don't teach. I teach a different way. That doesn't mean he's wrong and I'm right. It just means that it's different. Well, one of the problems with meditation groups is they start saying that my way is the only way. And it's not true. Your, your way might work to a degree. It de depends. What do you want to have as the end result of the meditation? Now, the end result of the meditation for me is always Nibbana. And having a happier life. It's always that. Now, some people, they just want to have deep concentration. Fine. They can do that. It doesn't make them wrong. It just, they don't have the same end result that I'm interested in. That's all. So there's no conflict, but an awful lot of different meditation practices, they like the conflict. And they aren't really practicing what the Buddha was talking about. So don't argue about meditation ever. Okay. And don't try to convince the, somebody else that they're not doing it correctly. But there's still an awful lot of things that you have in common with that person because they're looking to let go of suffering too. And that's, if you give each other little hints, they can take them or not take them. It's up to them and it's okay. So anybody else have a question? Hi, Bhante. Yes, hello. Hi, Bhante. Hi, how are you? Yes, thank you very much for the talk. Bhante, thank I've you. been uh, taking like uh, uh, online retreats uh, once in December and uh, with Keen, uh, with Dhamma Sukar, and now I'm taking one with uh, Dawson, which is actually very helping on many ways already. But still, like as you have mentioned, tapping back to like as a starter that we will probably 
probably see hindrances coming up when we are doing our practices. Right. So um, I do experience like hindrance that I is very obviously like uh, happening to me um, okay. during my first day um, in this particular retreat that I'm having with uh, four days, five days now. So it's a lot of restlessness, but you are talking about like, um, uh, con- like trying to see it and see what is the causes of it. Should right. we be yeah. looking at like how it happened or should we be just... Stay on your it? object of meditation as much as you can. Yeah. If your mind gets distracted, use the six hours and then come back. To yeah, your it's object the, of meditation. But the it cause, carries on. Mm, the sorry, cause yeah. of restlessness is trying too hard, putting in too much energy, too much effort. Soften your mind. Turn it into a game. Stop being serious with it. It's only a hindrance. It's not even yours. You didn't ask it to come up, right? So play with it. Have a lighter mind and the restlessness will disappear on its own. Yes, that's what I was advised. So we sh- actually do not need to contemplate and l- trying to no, understand. No. 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 Okay. If the restlessness is really overwhelming, then you ask yourself, why is this happening right now? And you will get an answer from your intuition. So pick and choose the right times for your to ask your questions. But just ask the question one time. Come back to your object of meditation. See what your intuition says. Your intuition will self tell you generally with restlessness, you're pushing. You're trying to control a little bit too much. You've got to back off a little bit. Soften your mind. Now remember, it's real important that you have fun when you do the meditation. And you laugh with yourself for getting caught. And you smile with yourself. Okay, these are important aspects of the meditation. Yes, yes, you have mentioned and so has Nelson. Um, it was just that at that very particular like uh, it, like day and uh, scenario is that there is a tinge of fear. It was the restless over continually okay. uh, on the, after the sitting, which I was trying to understand, which actually I see how it was there. Like it was a things that was um, I, I self-inflicted for a very long time of my life that I can see how it happens, but it still was like okay. that touch there. So I was Fear thinking- can be yeah. a major problem. It was it really a major can, It can really grab a hold of you and know the way to get overcome the fear. Lack. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't, I'm afraid. I don't want to laugh. Well, that's funny in itself. Okay. What does laughter do? Laughter changes your perspective from I am afraid to it's only this feeling. It's only this fear. It's not mine. So it takes it from this is really happening and I am afraid to it's only fear. Well, do you want to carry this fear around with you? No, you're not crazy. Let it go. Yeah, it was um, it was later that was uh, explained by the Dawson. It was like, who is that one who is in that fear? Like that right. that figure, the reflection right. of of and the why I have to get yeah. That's why, why I, I have say to... laugh. Yes, because exactly. That, takes that is the, the eye away from me. That happens a lot in Asia. There's black magic and all kinds of weird things that 
people can get caught up in. And when you develop your sense of humor about it, it's not going to trouble you anymore. Exactly. Yes, thank you, Bhante. <laughs> I can okay. see that. Sometimes it does happen, but most of the time it's still like you, the eye is so caught in there. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. But thank you very much. Yeah. It has been okay. so helpful with you and all your like uh, students that is all along that now is teaching me, which is so good. <laughs> right. Yes. I'm so grateful here. Really. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to my March sitting with you. Okay. Yeah. I look forward thank to you. it too. Isn't it fun to see somebody go from a fear state to a happy state is wonderful. That's the magic of the Buddhist teaching. It really is. Hi, Vanda. Yeah. I have one question. Um, you mentioned about dream later, um, earlier. Yeah. Does the dream uh, has got any significance in Buddhist teaching? Like if you dream about a monk or Buddha talking to you or anything like that? Uh, Does it have any teaching on you? If you have a dream and it has monks in it, that is a very, very wholesome, uh, happy kind of dream. If you have dreams that frighten you, now, a dream is a state in between deep sleep and awake. And you can change your dreams if they're frightening by radiating loving kindness into the dream that takes away the fear and the anxiety and the frustration and all of those kinds of things. So I know that there's a lot of different work that's been done with, uh, with dreams and controlling uh, what's happening in the dream. I had a friend that was working with his dreams and he thought, you know, I can jump over a building in my dream and there's no problem. I wonder if I don't put any limit on the dream. So I'm going to jump and just jump as high as I can go. And he did that, and he was going up so fast that it woke him up. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the dreams that have got some um, like teaching values, like if you... See a dream well, there are love. some prophetic dreams. I mean, even even in the suttas, there's a, a king that he had, what, 15 dreams, something like that. And he went to the Buddha, and the Buddha interpreted the dreams of things that were going to be happening in the future. Okay. So it can be it can be prophetic. I don't put a whole lot of stock into telling the future by dreams, but uh, you have to interpret as as you see fit. Okay, I can uh, email uh, David, and if we can uh, show you that, that would be great. See what is your interpretation of that. Well, I, I'm not really into interpretation very much. I have had dreams of uh, my teacher who, who died what, 10 years ago or so. I've had dreams of talking with him and I woke up exceptionally happy. I've had dreams of radiating loving kindness to all beings while I was asleep and waking up just with a really clear uplifted mind but it does I don't have many dreams 
They just don't occur so much. That I remember anyway. Right. Okay. No, just, just uh, if you see a monk or a Buddha asking a question and kind of like uh, that. Well, I, I would say that was wholesome. Be careful of the answer, though. Right. Okay. So it can point to a direction. It can. Okay. But how often does that happen? I, I don't know. Rarely. Very yeah. rare. Yeah. So, so you have to be careful with it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? I, this is Susan. I have some, okay. something to share with you. Okay. I had a dream about you. Oh. <laughs> you were in my dream. It was like a big theater, one of those old fashioned theater, and you were in the upper level, upper, like a box office, you know. Oh. No, I don't know. Maybe it's not <laughs> called box office, like the upper stage. And I was trying to get your attention, trying to pass you a message. Oh. And that's all. So I. Okay. I'm going to write to you what I was trying to say. Okay. I will ask David to pass my letter to you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank that's, you that's and good. thank you, in David. I'll tell you an experience that I had. I just moved to this big monastery in Kuala Lumpur. It's the largest monastery in Kuala Lumpur, and I started teaching meditation then. And there was a period of time that. It was about two weeks that absolute strangers would walk up to me and say, I had a dream about you. And this happened, oh, it must have been a dozen times. Complete strangers walking up and I dreamt about you. So I went to one of the uh, old senior monks and I told him about it. And I said, what does this mean? And he just shook his head and he said, they must be having nightmares. <laughs> and they stopped right after that. <laughs> Did make me laugh, I got to say. Also, if I may share yeah. uh, to the earlier person who spoke about dreams, um, Padma Sambhava, Guru Padma Sambhava, the Tibetan second Buddha, I believe he was called, talked about enlightenment through dreams because when we are awake, like right now, as I speak, I'm actually not awake, but in my deep sleep, it's actually then when I don't have, it's, the, it's actually then we don't have ego and that's when we are awake. Now, if we can navigate our dream to find Something, something, that's the part I don't know. That's where we can find enlightenment. It's called dream yoga, similar to lucid I've, dreaming. I've heard of that, but I'm not really convinced of it. Oh, please share your opinion. Well, my opinion is that the actual Nibbana is a letting go, a cooling down. Dreams... Uh, you don't have a lot of insights in the, into dreams. You don't have a lot of understanding of letting go, of craving, and, and seeing what that craving actually is. So I, I have my doubts as to whether that's a real thing or not. I'm not saying it's not. But I have my my personal doubts about whether that's true or not. Well, could it be part of the eight jhana? Because when you're in the eight jhana, no. basically, no, no, you no, are. There's, it's a quiet mind. The eighth jhana is a quiet mind. You don't. If if that would come up during the eighth jhana, you wouldn't be in the jhana anymore. That's a disturbance. No, what I'm saying is that could dreaming in a sleep 
interpreted as especially well not always that but uh, this happy or wholesome dream could it be uh, similar to the jhanas or you have to oh it's different it's not the same because in the eight jhana you are not really aware of the environment around you and very much not in the consciousness of the moment well you are in the consciousness you're watching mind right there is awareness there nibbana there is no consciousness so there's no uh, knowing whether you're in that jhana or not where, where you don't know where you are you don't, you don't even recognize that you're in it because there's nothing to recognize it right so and Bhante, I, if I may echo what you said, uh -huh. if I may echo what you said okay. and correct me if I'm wrong, when we are in jhana, we are not dreaming because we are meditating. Right. We are not dreaming when we are right. in jhana. Right. Because that's not sleeping, that's not dreaming. Right. If it's dreaming, then you're not. Well, so you're not going to be in jhana when you're dreaming. Because jhana leads to a quieter and quieter mind where there's nothing arising. And right. dreaming is actually an active kind of movement of mind's attention. Okay. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Well, it's been real fun today, so I hope you all benefited. And I'll see you next week. Be well. Sadhu, be happy. sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Turuan Sarani, Bhante, Turuan Sarani. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, David. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Thank, Thank you, David. You, have have Thank a you, fun everyone. week. Bye, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everyone.